I grew up in England, uh, in, and I was uh, sort of an early kid in the 1960s, and I kind of got excited at that time about things like the space program, which was sort of this, uh, this big future-looking technology effort. And after being sort of interested in that for a while, I then got curious about sort of what was underneath what one had to do in the space program, what was sort of the more fundamental kinds of questions that came up. And that got me interested in physics. And so when I was about 10 or so, I, I got seriously interested in physics, and I started buying all these books about physics, reading all this stuff, and I went through college textbooks and things like that. And uh, then uh, I started being interested in sort of collecting all this information about the world and about physics and so on. And so like I, I, I actually was reminded recently when I was uh, uh, 12 years old, I, I made this sort of, uh, sort of uh, encyclopedia of physics that I did with you know, typewriters and, uh, and pens and so on uh, that was sort of an attempt to collect kind of uh, existing knowledge together in an organized way. And I, I realized, uh, having built Wolfram Alpha, that actually it's sort of the same thing as what I was doing when I was 12 years old, um, but, uh, but now translated into sort of modern times and, and the technology that we have. What I was really interested in was doing physics and learning about physics and uh, getting to be as good as I could be in, in doing physics kinds of things. And I wasn't a particularly good kind of mechanical math type person and so on. And uh, so I, I very quickly uh, started seeing, well, how could, I, how could I use better tools than the ones that I had uh, uh, from my own brain, so to speak, to do those kinds of things. So I started using computers, and, the, um, and I was working on, on physics and particle physics and things like that. And I think I got fairly efficient at doing it, um, particularly because I ended up using lots of computer tools and so on, and I would use computers to do math calculations and so on, and people would always be very curious. They'd always assume that I must be incredibly good at doing these ornate algebraic computations, which was completely not the case. I, uh, all these ornate computations I just did by, by using tools, by using a computer. Uh, I think I, I sort of turned myself into a sort of physics research machine of some kind. But then I, I realized that I wasn't that impressed with the tools that existed. And so I said, OK, well, either my first step was to try and convince the people who'd worked on the tools that existed for doing things like mathematical calculations to make these tools better. And the, the young people at that time said, there'll never be anything better than the things we've already built. And the older people said, well, of course, there could be something better, but we're kind of too old and tired to, to do another project like this. So that got me started on, on uh, building my own tools for doing computation. And uh, I ended up building a big computer system called SMP that um, was uh, my first computer language. And it's kind of fun. When you, when you build a computer language, um, I remember when I, when I realized I really have to learn about computer science, which was, at the, this was 1979 or so. Computer science was still kind of a, 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 an early stage field at that time. And I remember going to the Caltech bookstore and buying all the books on computer science that existed at the time, which, which was only about this high a stack, and just systematically reading through those over the course of a few days. I said, OK, and now I know something about the, the current state of this field. And uh, I thought of myself as kind of a, a science nerd or some such other thing. But I realized that if I was actually going to see something useful happen with this by then quite large software system that I developed, that there had to be some sort of uh, uh, worldly track to it. And that really, in practice, meant uh, having a company and uh, distributing things in a commercial way and all those kinds of things. I didn't know anything about that stuff. As it turned out, I later realized that uh, actually I'd been sort of organizing things all my life. I mean, when I was in, in, in school as a kid, I was always the person who was organizing this or that event or this or that thing. Usually they were not events that were part of any kind of standard track. They were just things that I thought should happen, and so I tried to make them happen. But um, the main thing that I learned from the experience was that I actually wasn't as bad as I thought I was at doing things like running companies and figuring out how to make business happen and so on. I considered it all pretty elementary and common sense and so on, and uh, uh, sort of the same uh, analytical skills that one gets to use in doing science or something like that. I always sort of uh, talk about whether people continue to engage the thinking apparatus and all the different things that they do, and it's remarkable to what extent people can be tremendously smart about one thing, but then the thinking apparatus is disengaged when it comes to doing other things. But if you keep it engaged, I, I think, uh, at least in my experience, doing business has not been a terribly, terribly hard thing. Uh, I got to thinking more about science, and I'd been interested in all kinds of uh, sort of fundamental questions in science, and I was particularly sort of curious about sort of drilling down um, uh, looking at sort of natural science and the natural world and trying to understand sort of what's fundamentally going on in the natural world. 
And uh, I was actually curious about things about cosmology and how uh, things like galaxies form and how one gets structure in the universe. On the one hand, on the other hand, I was interested in things about sort of artificial intelligence and how brains work and so on. And I realized that a lot of these different problems had one feature in common. They all were things where uh, there might be fairly simple underlying components in the systems, but the actual behavior of the systems was immensely complicated. So I got interested in sort of the fundamental question of uh, when you have simple components, how can they build up to do very complicated things? So I was curious whether there was sort of a different paradigm for doing science uh, that one could invent uh, that would be more successful in these broader kinds of areas. And sort of the, the general point of view is, uh, if you're going to make a model for a theory for something, something like that, there, has to be some, there have to be definite rules underlying the behavior of the system. But the question is, what is the structure? What's the character of those rules? And conveniently, in modern times, we have a kind of a, a way of thinking about such things, and that's computation. If you're shown two objects, one of them is an artifact, one of them is something that gets made by, by nature, it's a pretty good heuristic that the one that looks more complicated is the one that was made by, by nature. It's sort of embarrassing for our technology that that's the case. But the reason that's happening is that when we build things with technology today, most of the time we are setting things up, we're sort of carefully engineering things so that we can foresee exactly how the system will behave. Nature doesn't have any such constraint, and so it gets to sort of sample this computational universe of possibilities in a much broader way. So I, I got to sort of start developing the kind of a whole area of science that was based on phenomena like this, and my sort of plan A was uh, that I would uh, say, okay, there's this great area of complex systems research, um, you know, I'll start a research institute that does that, I'll start a journal that does that, and I'll get everybody in the world to, uh, or some appropriate slice of the world to be interested in doing this kind of thing. That was plan A, was that, you know, I'd sort of done a bunch of early intellectual work and I would then sort of get other people to, to help. Um, that went much more slowly than I had patience for. And so in the mid-80s, I kind of said, okay, this is, this is not the right plan. Um, let me try a different plan. And my different plan was, let me build the best possible tools I can to do the science I want to do. So that's when I, I started building Mathematica, a language, a system for, for doing all kinds of computations. And sort of my goal with it has been uh, to sort of put all the, all the sort of algorithmic knowledge that exists in the world, all the sort of formal knowledge that exists, and build it into a sort of coherent system that that people can use, and indeed Mathematica gets used in uh, a large fraction of the world's sort of R&D uh, centers and so on, and uh, most of the universities in the US. And so one of the implications of this principle of computational equivalence is that there isn't really a huge sort of bright line between sort of intelligence-like stuff that happens in humans and complicated co stuff that happens in computational systems. So I s sort of realized that, that actually when it comes to these, you know, making an intelligence or something, that really from my science I pretty much just proved it's all just computation. And so having realized that, said, okay, if it's all just computation, I built the system, Mathematica, that does all this computational stuff, uh, let me try and use that to actually uh, do this thing that I've been meaning to do for 30 years and sort of try and wrap together sort of the, the, the knowledge of the world in some computational way. So you build a system, it knows all the stuff, uh, it can compute all these things, you implement all these different models and algorithms and so on that exist in the world. So another issue is how do you communicate with the system? Well, you might say, well, you build up a computer language like Mathematica and so on, but there's just too much, there's too broad a set of things that uh, one has to talk about in the world. So really the only choice is to interact with the thing using ordinary human natural language. Well, people have been trying to solve the problem of, you know, how do you do, do communicate with, uh, get computers to understand natural language forever. The problem that we had, we wanted to solve, was the problem of if people are going to just ask questions, can we at least understand their question and turn it into some kind of computable, uh, precise form that we can then go and do things with. So anyway, the, the, um, the result of all of this is that um, we indeed built this thing called Wolfram Alpha, which uh, uh, got released into the wild uh, about two years ago now. You know, the idea of Wolfram Alpha is that you can just type in some question, you know, you might type in some mathy type question, uh, something like that, and you could type it in sort of however you think about it, and it'll try and answer the question, and it'll try and uh, tell you some interesting things about the answer to that, that, that you might like to know about the answer to that question. When, when the computer works out an integral or something, it, um, uh, it does it using very efficient, very non-human techniques. We, in a sense, completely cheat. We use stuff that has, is not what humans do. 
Um, I mean, in fact, what we basically use is the last 300 or so years of, of development in, in science and related kinds of quantitative areas. Because, you know, if we're trying to solve a physics problem, you can do it sort of the medieval way where you say, let's reason like natural philosophers or something about how this thing, you know, pushes that thing that pushes that thing and so on. Um, but uh, you can also do the thing of saying, well, let's set it up as a bunch of equations or a, a, some set of, so some algorithm, and then let's just sort of blast through the answer using the best kind of uh, algorithmic or scientific tools that we can, and, and that's, that's how we do things. Actually, from the work that I did on New Kind of Science, um, I came to disagree with the point of view that it wasn't going to be possible to find a sort of a simple fundamental theory of physics. And I realized that when you look at these kinds of systems that have very simple rules, behave in very complicated ways, the obvious question is, is that how our universe works? And so the, then the question comes, in this computational universe of possible rules for how things work, does our physical universe live out there in this computational universe? And then the question is, if it does live out there in the computational universe, how difficult is it to find? If we just search this computational universe, uh, will we find our physical universe out there? And I sort of came to the point of view that, well, it's pretty embarrassing if we could, with this current state of technology and so on, search the computational universe and find the fundamental theory for our universe. It's embarrassing not to try to do that. So uh, I put some effort into, into trying to do that. And it's sort of interesting because uh, what you see happening is uh, a lot of phenomena like special relativity, like Einstein's theory of gravity, like certain phenomena in quantum mechanics um, that are sort of fancy hallmarks of current physics, you can make those things from incredibly simple rules. I get to try and sort of forage the world for, for really smart people who uh, I think, I hope, are often way ahead of me. And then you have kids, and, the, and your kids, of course, are always smarter than you.